so glad to be with you on this last Sunday of February. Can you believe that? Just like that, two months down, ten to go in this new year. It is so good to be with you. If you're visiting for the first time, I say to you, please know that you are welcome, that you are loved, and that God is well pleased. We have this benevolent, trinitarian God as well. I want to thank everyone uh, who attended my installation service last night. It was such a good time. Thank you, everyone, who was here. Yeah. Ah, the music, the food, the food was so good, too. Thank you, everyone, who cooked, who supported, who uh, was just involved. It was just a beautiful, beautiful time. There's something about being together. So, so good to be with you last night. Thank you for all your support. I titled today's sermon, The Way to Transfiguration is the Way to the Cross. But let me begin with a personal story. There was a season in my life that I served as a mission pastor in downtown L.A. in a community known as the Skid Row which is perhaps the largest houseless community in the world. And my role was to come in and to preach five days a week during the chapel services. And so they would open up this chapel in the mission. Two to three hundred people would come into this mission at the room because after this chapel, there would be a dinner. And as I would begin to preach, I would preach God's love and grace, and I would try to speak hope and joy and peace into this gathering. I would invite people forward. I would pray for those people. I would bless them. And then we would go off to have the meal. And in the program at the mission was about 12 to 15 men who were also in need of discipleship and leadership. One of those men was a man named Oscar. Oscar is very joyful, loving, hardworking, trustworthy man who had been in the program, by the way, a year before I arrived. He was the cook of the mission. Now, you have to understand, in the mission, if you're the cook, that's some privilege because you get to go to the refrigerator at any time any day that you want to. And so Oscar would be our cook, and he would be always involved, serving hard. You know, on the weekends when I would leave, he would say, Pastor, don't worry about it. I'll watch over the guys. And there came a moment that I thought, why is Oscar here in this program? He clearly has overcome his uh, abuse of alcohol. He had clearly become this self-giving person had, had just done everything in his life that just demonstrated to me that he was ready to go back out into the world. And so I would sit with Oscar and I would pray and I would counsel him and I would say, Oscar, you know, I think you're ready. I think God is saying it's time to go. It's time for you to go and into the world, back to something that perhaps is God is calling me to, and we would pray, he would just say, you know, Pastor, I'm afraid. He says, I'm afraid to go back out into the world because I may return back to the unhealthy things that I was And I would say to Oscar, if that's okay, then let's pray. Let's look for God. Let's trust that God is with you. Then came the day that Oscar came to me after many conversations, many discussions. Oscar said to me, I think it's time for me to go back out into the So Oscar decided to overcome his fear and he moved out of the mission and he moved in with his sister's family. I remember the day that I said goodbye. I, I bless 
blessed him, hugged him, I encouraged him, and I remember saying to him, God is with you, God will help you. We had a whole celebration and we sent Oscar off into the world. But there was something about Oscar's heart, something about his mind, that had a way. The appearance of his face, it had changed. He had become a transfigured individual, shall we say. Do you know how many stories like that I've encountered in my life? And, and this story, it moves me to really tears of joy, tears of hope, tears of reconciliation. You know, today's wisdom from Luke's Gospel, it describes another transfiguration moment. It is yet another of the great hinges in the life of Jesus on earth. You know, without this moment, the rest of the Gospel account, it cannot unfold. One cannot trivialize the amazing and mysterious scene of this passage. Jesus, imagine for a moment with Jesus at the top of the mountain, praying, praying for discernment for the way forward. He receives the response, and then listen to this, the appearance on his face changes. His clothes flashing like lightning, the transfiguration of our Lord happens, one of the most decisive turning points in the gospel story. And then, there's more to the scene, as you know, right? There is more because two men appear talking with Jesus, Moses, the great Hebrew lawgiver, Elijah, the greatest of all the Hebrew prophets, and as the apostles were there, they labored, did you catch it? They labored to remain awake. They were half asleep. However, it was only until they were fully awake that they saw Jesus' glory. As they entered into the cloud, the divine presence, right? This glory cloud, shall we say. There, they were overcome with awe and wonder as the voice of God said, This is my Son, my chosen one. Listen to me. Now, I recognize this morning that we may not fully understand what happened at the Mount of Transfiguration. It is a mystery, but the magnitude of the moment cannot be minimized. Clearly, Jesus was aware of the growing opposition of the danger, right, that was lurking around him. But what we do know is that Jesus went up to the mountain, went to seek God's advice, to consult with the divine about what comes next. But what am I referring to when I say, what comes next? Well, let's consider a unique detail that is revealed in the conversation between Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. I don't know if you caught it, but Scripture says that they spoke about Jesus' departure. Now, in the ancient Greek, the word departure literally means exodus. It is to say that the dialogue between the three men was about Jesus' exit from this earth. Did you hear? This is the conversation that was happening. The news that Jesus received while in prayer. The news that changed the appearance of his face. The news of his exodus. This was the news of his exit from earth, which he would achieve in Jerusalem, Jesus said. Now, I don't know how much you know about Jerusalem, but Jerusalem is the place where prophets go. And therefore, the pathway to Jerusalem was the pathway towards death on a cross. And perhaps all that Jesus desired at that very moment was just some assurance, some endorsement, some approval. Because undoubtedly, Jesus 
did not make any decisions without the approval of God. And with God's endorsement, Jesus set out to Jerusalem with full affirmation. So let's, let's pause here for a moment. Because we somewhat can understand what this moment means for Jesus. But what about us? If I'm honest with you this week, it's been a challenge for me. I have been distracted by the worrisome images of war, the, the forced invasion of a country, uh, the hellish violence upon innocent people. See, our prayers are with you praying this morning. All creation mourns and weeps at the sound of destruction. And I do pray that our strength would come from love and not violence. I do pray that our wealth would come from our sharing and not our money, that our victory would come from forgiveness and not revenge. But I'm honest with you, I've been asking uh, our Trinitarian God, what does the transfiguration of Jesus mean for us today in this season of life, in these troubling times? You see, the pandemic, it almost seems trivial in comparison to death and war. Certainly, I believe that the mountain experience uh, for the apostles changed them forever. So much so that they didn't even speak about it. And you know there are these moments that we know that we know that God is with us and guiding us. We don't speak about it, but we know it. See, I believe this encounter right here contains the necessary wisdom for us today. I mentioned earlier how the apostles battled to stay awake and how the revelation of Jesus became clear upon their full awakening, right? And here is where I think the ancient wisdom enters the room this day. Right here in this moment is where I encourage you to open your hearts, your minds, your souls, to the Holy Spirit, to the Triune God. Because it's honestly, we know in recent history that living through nearly two years of systemic uh, uh, issues in this world, seismic shifts, that the world has changed. Things are no longer the same. Living through a modern revolution of how to be human all due to a global pandemic, it has changed us. And it seems that we have missed so much because our hearts and minds have fallen asleep. You know, there are clearly things in this world that keep our hearts and minds asleep. For example, our biases, which are largely preconceived, right? Uh, uh, notions and unreasoned beliefs. And this is how racism and uh, xenophobia, how they breathe today in our society, these unreasonable and hostile feelings and opinions about a particular ethnic or racial group without any merit. And this is how homophobia and transphobia tend to manifest today through preconceived notions without first-hand authentic relationships and careful education about this community. You see, when we set our minds on only our ideas, and only our opinions, then our minds and hearts will become shut, closed. When we set our, our minds on only um, our feelings and our emotions, then we shut out everyone else. And when a new idea comes, an awakening knocks at our door, we are unable to open that door because our minds and hearts are fast asleep. You see Peter, James, and John, they nearly missed the entire transfiguration of Jesus because of their slumber. Our hearts, our minds must be fully awake so to not miss the glory of life, the glory of Jesus. To miss the smiles on the faces of our children, of our grandchildren. To miss the kisses and the hugs of our partners and loved ones. Oh, to miss the joy of our pets when we arrive home after a long day. 
the glory, cloud of God, covering us with awe and wonder. Oh, how it is to not to miss that, but lament it. You see, life inevitably awakens the dormant heart and mind one way or another. For example, take sorrow. Sorrow can rudely awaken the heart and mind. One will experience loss, grief, and sadness. And it is a fact that disappointment and regret will arrive at one's doorstep. But is it not in the loss, in the grief, in the pain, in the suffering that one is in? You see, out of that we emerge, transfigured, shall we say, with a deeper understanding, a broader perspective, a softer heart. And somehow, one still sees the glory of Jesus through the tears of such seasons. And what about good old-fashioned sense of need? Having a sense of need can also awaken the sleeping heart and mind, the reality of living the routine life half asleep. When suddenly into life comes a problem that we are incapable of solving, or explaining something beyond our control, beyond our understanding, something that we cannot fix or solve on our own. And that sense of hopelessness, it propels us to cry out, to scream to any hope we can find, to seek something that will remedy the pain, that will relieve the uncertainty, that will calm the anxiety. You see, moments such as these in waking the sleeping heart and mind it awakens it towards God. And our prayer must be, Lord, keep us awake at all times. You see, this kind of awakening is present in our world today. It really is. Just this week, we saw it in the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team. The recent agreement and settlement with U.S. Soccer Federation over equal pay and advancement of equality in soccer that embodies an awakened heart and mind. You see, both parties acknowledge the difficulty of, of this process, saying, getting to this day has not been easy. But how could it be? Six years of complaints, of lawsuits, of setbacks, of discouragements, and even having a federal judge dismiss the women's claim, and yet they overcame, they changed the system. He transfigured an entire sport, changed history for women. People pay for women will last forever in some. It's like, I guess what I'm trying to say to you this morning, what I'm submitting to you, what I'm putting down, and I hope you're picking up, is that Jesus' transfiguration should evoke a person. Are your heart and mind awake? Do they need to be transfigured? And not only must Jesus' transfiguration evoke a personal awakening, but it must also evoke systemic and institutionalized transfiguration. You know, Oscar Romero, the martyred Roman Catholic bishop of El Salvador, Describe the transfiguration of Jesus not as a glimpse of Jesus' end glory, but as a profound implication of the followers of Jesus both then and now. You see, Romero urges the followers of Jesus to be made anew. To be made anew so that the church will be made anew, so that our societies, our nations, our history itself would be transfigured. But Romero also said that the way to transfiguration is the same way for Jesus, the way to the cross. One cannot disassociate transfiguration from the cross. One cannot disassociate transfiguration with suffering. Jesus, the chosen one, 
chooses to go to Jerusalem to be nailed to a cross to complete his mission. And on that cross, Jesus died. Died to take away our sins, our failures, mistakes, transgressions, to take away our slumber, our sleeping, and to give us his successes, his forgiveness, his righteousness, his life. And he rose from the grave three days later, and through his resurrection, a new exodus, a new exodus is the birth. A liberating exodus is released into the world, a liberation movement that was continued by his disciples, a liberation movement that continues today by these disciples in this room and around the world. What do we do with such a liberating exodus? What do we do with such profound freedom, with this movement, with such love and grace being poured out, with such an awakening being offered for us this morning? Perhaps our only human response to such a moment exists is to be by the Holy Spirit, awakening our minds and hearts to oneself, to our neighbor, to this world, to all of creation, and to advocate for a transfiguration world where our churches, societies, nations, our history are being made anew, just for all, equitable, for all, inclusive, for all. Now, living looks like 